Hello, everybody. My name is Linda Schmidtobreik. I am the deputy head of the Office for Science in Chile. And next to me, you see Giacomo Beccari, who has the same position in Garching. Together, we will be hosting this event, a virtual tour to the various ESO sites. This tour is different from our normal public tours in the sense that it is tailored for early career scientists, for astronomers who are curious about the ESO fellowship and consider applying for it. The tour guides today are ESO fellows who are also available for you to ask questions at the end of the tour. So please let me introduce you, Rosita Kokotanekova, fellow in Garching, Hugo Messias, who is a former ESO ALMA fellow and recently became an ESO ALMA staff astronomer, and Johanna Hartke, who is an ESO Paranal fellow. I hand over to Giacomo. Okay, thank you, Linda. Thank you very much for, for the introduction and, and a big welcome also on my side. My name is Linda said, my name is Giacomo Beccari. I am the deputy head of the Office of Science here in Garching, and I welcome you to this virtual tour. So we will soon be walking, thanks to our guides, we will go through the, the ESO premises and we will see ESO, but let me just briefly uh, start with a very short introduction and general introduction about the ESO Fellowship Program. So the program is designed to help you, to help the young scientists to develop their independent research. So as you will, uh, you will see, you will have the chance now to see ESO is a really, is a kind of a special and kind of unique place where you can do your research. Um, ESO provides is a very rich and diverse scientific environment. Our fellow, in fact, they have a chance to interact with many young PhD students. They even also have the chance that they are actually encouraged to supervise and mentor and tutor our PhD students. But not only, they also interact with our uh, faculty member, the senior staff astronomers. We count a number of almost 100 people among the faculty, so it's a very rich faculty where all science topics are covered. Um, and also, uh, so there we have a huge um, set of seminars, science events, uh, science talk, uh, daily coffee, topical coffees, and all of so we have a very rich uh, science activity. Now with the uh, unfortunately, with the COVID-19, we moved everything online, but everything is still very much active and happening. Every day, every single day, there is a new event. And this is all meant to not only to provide a stimulating uh, scientific environment, but also to foster collaborations and to maybe also, why not, trigger new ideas. Because And that's because exactly of the, the rich diversity of, of, of topics that we have, that we cover, that we are exposed to. Uh, being part of the of uh, of, of the of uh, of the of, the, of, of the science life at ESO, um, so we also uh, fellows. In fact, they drive very often our science activity because they they are they lead most of the of the science activity. They lead uh, they they act as chair organizer of many of our activities of uh, of several talks that we have. Uh, we also offer a, a quite generous travel uh, support for our fellows. And uh, we have a very, uh, very strong, very beautiful uh, visitor program and a program to support the organization of workshop. And this is all meant to also uh, help ESO and help our fellow in particular to connect with, uh, with, um, with the, the community outside ESO. Uh, then, then we, we also uh, have a very interesting uh, a very beautiful actual training program meant to train uh, managerial skills or uh, supervisor skills or, or soft skills. So all, all those skills that will enrich your CV so that you are ready then to jump into your next step in the career, which is going to be a senior step. And finally, I would like to mention that there is another important aspect that I think characterizes the fellowship in a particular way, which is the fact that in, Chi in Garching, uh, fellows are uh, basically um, invest 25% 20, uh, of their time for functional work. So in support, basically, of the observatory. So you can be in support of the operation, in support of the following uh, instrument development, following the archive, user support. Uh, you can also uh, duty related to ALMA support. 
so outreach is a, is a huge, uh, very important activity related to outreach. So this is all basically done, designed in a way that you, this 25% of time that you spend is a fact, a way to again enrich your curriculum in a very unique way, in, in, in spending time in something that you will not find in other places. Um, so there are, this is a few of the aspects that are really much more that I would like to say, but I, I know I have a limited time, so I would like not to spend too much time on this. And now we are soon going into the Israel premises, so I will uh, hand over back to, to Linda for the tour. Thank you very much. Thanks, Giacomo. Yes, I would like to mention specifically for Chile that the duty at the observatories, either at Alma or at Paranal, take up 50% of the time here. So you only have 50% available for personal science. So if you think of applying for the fellowship here, you have to take this into consideration. You are going to be part of a great team at the observatory. It's a super interesting, it's a lot of fun, but it is also a lot of work and uh, it's a lot of responsibility and you need to be committed to do this. So for this reason, also in the selection process in Chile, we put a bit more weight on soft skills than the Garching, than Garching does, because we need our fellows to integrate well in the team, to take responsibilities, to work independently, to take the observations, to support visitors. As a reward for this dedication and the higher duty level, the Chile fellows are awarded a fourth year of pure science, which they can take at any institute in an ESO member state, including Australia and Chile. Apart from that, the fellowship in Chile is similar to the one in Garching. Uh, we also have a rich scientific environment at the Vitacura campus that you will see later during the tour. So I would say we get started and I now hand over to Hugo, who will lead you to Alma. Yes, so hi everyone. I'm Hugo, um, and um, Basically, as Alinda said, I, I'm a former uh, uh, Alma Fellow, uh, and I um, and I now become recently uh, an astronomer at the uh, Department of Science Operations um, in um, in Santiago. So, what you are seeing now is actually um, basically the, the what we call the Operation Site Site Facility. This was back in uh, 2011, uh, when you would still see some antennas down here, uh, as well uh, around the, the technical um, building. This is uh, uh, the security uh, room here. These windows here, actually, are, are, um, are where the control room at the OSF, what we call OSF, is. Uh, but if you actually want to to see the antennas in 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 action, is actually down this valley. Here we are at uh, three thousand meters, uh, almost three thousand meters. Uh, we used to sleep uh, on these um, on these on these rooms here to the left. Now we have a, a residencia. Um, as a fellow, you'll be most of the time at uh, uh, in Santiago. Uh, and eventually, uh, also induced by this COVID situation, some of your duties will be uh, to operate the, the telescope from Santiago itself. Uh, if uh, or when, when you get the chance to go to the OSF, you're supposed to stay at uh, 3,000 meters. Uh, only the technicians and engineers go to the, the antennas. But if you coordinate and if you ask, you can go to the antennas as well. And this is the... Wait, this is the second slide that I wanted to show you, uh, which basically this is already the view at 5,000 meters uh, in the um, Chajnantor Plateau. Uh, you will see the seven meter uh, Japanese antennas. You'll see all the other 12 meters. Uh, eventually, even at the OSF, you'll see the transporter of the antennas. Um, here, you you might see it in action, uh, but it's a really beautiful view with snow, without snow, with all the antennas in compact configuration, far apart. I mean, it's um, it's it's an impressive view, and it feels like when you get there, 
uh, it feels like an accomplishment. So, um, so please, I mean, consider do consider applying because it's it will be life changing. Yeah, uh, I think so. So, if you have any questions, I I'm I'm happy to uh, answer just now if there are any. Oh, hi, this is Francisco. Okay. Um, there is no questions, but okay. maybe we can we can come back to the slide before, okay, uh, and and show a little bit the control room or where is the control room where most of the most of the work is done. There was a slide. This is laboratory control room. Okay, I thought it was it would be harder to to get into there. So basically, uh, at the control room, you'll have all these monitors. Um, it's slightly different now, but uh, you have the scientific uh, uh, control uh, monitors and the operating uh, monitors um, uh, on one side and the other. Because basically, we as scientists, we we can run the observations, but whoever speaks to the antennas are the operators. So uh, they they know their dirty little secrets to actually start working and uh, and if if they go offline, for instance, um, so we need we need up to in order for us to speak to the array, we need to go through the operators. But we will be saying which of the projects will be run, and for that we need all these kind of um, monitors to control the weather, uh, or not to control the weather, but to monitor the weather. And see which uh, which is the best pro uh, project to run, um, and that's that's uh, that's why we need so many monitors uh, because um, there's a lot of information to run. At Alma, you're basically uh, observing with three observatories. So I showed you the seven meter. There's also um, four 12 meter that can work independently, not as an interferometer. And then there's all the other. Uh, 12 meter antenna. So sometimes you get to be observing with three observatories at the same time. Uh, although we try to avoid this and have always two people controlling the three. But that's that. That's what makes it fun, really. Hugo, we have two questions. One is: yeah. as a fellow in Chile, is the yeah. assignment to Paranal or Alma arbitrary or based on our scientific preference? I mean, so, this is more so, general, but you can probably answer yeah. that as well. Yeah, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, in the part uh, of Alma, uh, you, in the beginning, you already say, what are your interests? I mean, for instance, I got involved with a uh, 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 very long baseline interferometry project at Alma, and uh, which uh, which uh, resulted in the M87 um, uh, black old shadow imaging re uh, last year. So that's that was pretty cool, uh, but there are other projects which um, will eventually um, um, uh, maximize the the scientific use of Alma. Uh, so you'll be able to actually um, um, be involved uh, in many developing projects at Alma. At, as for VLT, uh, you will get assigned uh, a, a new T and an instrument, correct? And so. Yes. Um, so, it, it, and that will depend on your scientific interests, uh, and with that ex uh, experience, you actually uh, get, uh, I mean, very exper um, experienced in that instrument, and people will eventually like to work with you because you're you're basically the the best person to 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 work with a given instrument or or a, or a G O T. So. Yeah, that kind of leads us to the next question, which is what kind okay. of duties, duty work is carried out as a fellow? And I think this is in so particular for Alma now. We, we can go to Paranal later when we when we okay. go to Paranal. Okay, perfect, perfect. So, so again, the question is? What so. kind of duty work is carried out as a fellow? So as a fellow, uh, there's plenty of things that you can do. Of course, observations is definitely one of them. Um, other things are to... Um, uh, depending on the demands of the observatory to actually inspect the data from the um, uh, taken from the observatory so you'll be the first person to see a given result uh, a given image um, from a from a given project um, and uh, and also 
uh, you'll be involved in technical um, duties such, such as um, some um, project um, uh, development, as I was saying. I mean, for instance, Alma was built at 5,000 meters to avoid um, the um, water vapor in the atmosphere as much as possible. So one of the things is actually uh, the high frequency going to submillimeter in the spectral range, um, in the electromagnetic um, spectrum. So, uh, and there's a, a lot of technical uh, or uh, observing strategies that need to be tested to improve the, the efficiency of ALMA observing at those frequencies. And those, many of those um, projects are still under development. Uh, and the more ideas, the, the more projects you will have like this. So it's part of your duties to actually help on these um, um, development projects as well. So There's another question. In non-COVID times, how much time per year do you spend at the observatory as a Chile fellow? And I think for, for Paranal, I can say this is 80 nights. For Alma, you spend more time in Santiago as well, right? So I don't know how much so, time that is. So, so yes, I mean, uh, for um, for Alma, you can either spend your technical time as at observing, um, and I per year, depending on the demands, I was uh, going up between uh, up to seven times. Okay, but you can be requested to uh, be observing up to eleven. But since I was uh, involved in other technical projects, uh, many, many times I would stay in Santiago to, to go through all the technical, um, the te technical work. So it's, 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 you go with the flow and uh, you'll get organized. Yeah, and, so it's uh, a maximum of 80 nights, right? But then yes, yes. part of that is done. OK, one, so, one last question on Alma think, specifically. Okay, uh, yes. Um, there's a question. I work on VLBI technical side of things. Are there VLBI projects for ALMA, but more related into the technical side of things? Oh, yeah. I mean, so uh, there are still, um, this is, uh, I don't know how sensitive this is, but uh, but of course, I mean, it's uh, it's one project that was developed to uh, to operate at uh, three millimeters and one millimeter. And the goal is actually to now, and this was continuum, and now the goal is actually to do eventually a spectral line, but also a higher frequency VLBI. And that's under development for sure, yes. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, Hugo, I know you have to go, right? <laughs> so. No, no, no. Actually, I think we were told actually you need to move on. So, so <laughs> I'll I'll now uh, hand over to um, to Joanna, right? Yes. Yeah, and we will have more time for questions at the yes, end. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'll be free. So send an email and thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Joanna Hartke. I am an ESO fellow with uh, duties in Chile. I'm nearly finished with my with my second year, and I'm going to um, tell take you on a little tour of Paranal, and I'm going to show you also on the way a bit what are you going to be your duties as as a fellow on Paranal, and what makes this place such a great place and such an exciting place to work. So we start off on the platform of the VLT. You might know that they flattened off the Cerro Paraná, the mountain, to make place for all the telescopes. And uh, Linda, in the beginning, already talked about how great it is to work in this team on Paraná and how much we value teamwork there. And this is, I think, one of the scenes that captures this really beautifully. Because here you can see a group of, of astronomers, maybe also some visiting scientists, um, enjoying the sunset on Paranal. And this is one of our nightly rituals that we take part in before we start the night and we stand together as a group, maybe have a coffee um, before we start observing and we start preparing for the night. You can see some preparations have already been done. The telescopes are already open. Here you see uh, the four UTs lined up behind each other. You see um, one of the 80s, the auxiliary telescopes that we use for interferometry. Um, and yeah, the, the 
platform basically in the middle of the laboratory for the interferometry and we are going to go inside of one of the unit telescopes uh, just now this is um, UT3 also known as Medipal and you can see here the main structure is basically all the telescopes from the inside look very similar actually as a fellow you will not spend much time inside the telescope itself maybe for the initial training or if you bring uh, visitors, if you have a visiting astronomer, for example, they might want to see the inside of the telescope and the opening, which is always very majestic. So here the telescope would open up, you would see uh, the sky. Um, and yeah, inside you can see the massive primary mirror with eight meters diameter, the secondary, and also the three instruments that are in each of the unit telescopes at the um, Naismith platform and also at the Cascara Focus. Um, because as an ESO fellow uh, with duties in Chile, we are not only responsible for uh, carrying out night operations, but similar to fellows at ALMA, we can also get involved on the project level and that normally works such that we are assigned to be an instrument fellow. Um, this is based both on our scientific interests, but also of course what the observatory needs at the time and where there are open projects. So we take care of one, one of these machines, basically together with the instrument scientist who is an astronomer on Paranal. And as an instrument fellow for a new instrument that, for example, has just arrived on the mountain, um, one is involved in the, in the commission, uh, commissioning for older instruments that might be more related to keeping the instrument alive and making sure it still performs well after five, 10 or sometimes 20 years. And this is a great opportunity to be involved really at a very deep level and to make you an expert in the instrument. And you don't have to be an expert in the instrument when you arrive. For example, I'm currently the Muse Fellow and I've only really um, started to, to use Muse in such an extent after I arrived um, at ESO in Chile. One task as an instrument fellow may, for example, be that um, you assess the feasibility of the observing proposals that come in every semester and that really gives you the, the best tools to write better proposals yourself because you know exactly what you have to look for. And in the end, you can probably write these feasibilities in your sleep, but you also really become the expert by working with all the experts that we have on Paranal. So, of course, I already told you most of the time we don't spend in the telescope but we do spend it in the control room, which is located just below the platform. So let's go there for a bit. So this is how it looks like from the outside. We have some uh, coolers and chillers over here and really the main business happens over here in the control building. So this is how the control room looks like from the inside. I think from the setup, um, it looks very similar to, to many modern observatories these days. You have an array of screens um, and we have four of them for each of the telescopes and we also have um, uh, another set of, of screens and workspaces for the interferometry for the VLTI. So for example here at UT4 where I would spend most of my nights you can see we have here the screen for the telescope operator and then here where these two guys currently sit would be where you would perform both your day or nightly work. You might want to know what we do during the day as fellows. We mostly take care of the calibrations because if we take data the night before and it's not properly calibrated, it's completely useless. So during the day, we make sure that the calibrations are done okay and we coordinate a bit between the calibration work going on and um, maintenance work done by the engineers. And of course, during the night, we do the Q observation or we support visiting astronomers, which is always a great opportunity to interact with uh, scientists from all over the world and to learn a lot about um, science topics that might be very, very far removed from our own. Um, what we unfortunately cannot see here, but if we would go down this hallway, there are two very important rooms. One of them, if we go past the consoles, would be um, the meeting room where we daily coordinate with engineers once in the morning, where we plan the day. So this would be an important meeting if you were on the day shift. And for the night, we also have a meeting just before the start of the night 
discussing, for example, with which instrument we start or whether there is something special going on in terms of visitors or opening times. And then there's also the kitchen where we would um, take our night snacks because you might know that during the um, observing times, food is especially important. Um, during the day, we don't uh, stay in the control room all day, but we would go down to the Residencia, um, which is located below the summit of Paranal. Here you can see the main entrance. You see the Residencia has quite a stunning architecture and it's submerged in a valley right at the foot of Paranal. And up there, you can always keep an eye on the telescopes. And if we go inside, um, it really looks like in the James Bond movie, Quantum of Solace, you have this kind of jungle, you have this oasis in the middle of the desert, which I think is quite important um, yeah, to recharge after a long day or a long night of observing. Uh, you can see here we have the foosball table. There's also some table tennis you can play with colleagues. And there outside of the residencia, yeah, there's also a gym um, and a sports hall where you can play sports with your colleagues, which is really nice. And if we were to continue there, there's also uh, the cafeteria where we have all the meals together with our colleagues. And yeah, I think this is um, a nice place to interact with colleagues, but also it's very nice and very easy there to, to meet really scientists from all over the world who come to ESO for observations. And it really yeah, enriches the experience of being an ESO fellow. Um, we're not going to take questions now, I think, but I'm going to hand over to Rosita such that she can show you the Gassian campus. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosita Kokotanekova, and I am finishing the second year as a fellow uh, here in, in Garching in Germany. Um, I will begin my tour uh, with a view of our buildings from the outside. But first of all, here is a map of where ISO headquarters are situated to the north of the center of Munich between the center and the airport. Um, and we also have really beautiful buildings that, that have amazing architecture uh, that's really impressive. And here I would start uh, looking at, at the buildings from the new building where uh, many of the faculty, a lot of the administration and the, the engineers work. Here is the ISO Supernova, uh, our outreach center with the planetarium where you can get involved as a fellow, either through your functional work or through uh, volunteering just to get some experience with outreach. Um, as Giacomo said earlier, as fellows in Garching, um, in, in headquarters, we get even more flexibility to choose our functional work. So we devote to it 25% of our time and we can choose between many different fields. We can work in archiving, we can work in, in the uh, outreach department, we can uh, choose ALMA duties. In my case, I spend 25% of my time supporting the operations in Paranal, which for us translates uh, when in no COVID, <laughs> outside of COVID time that translates to 40 nights on the mountain. Otherwise, now currently I'm, I'm working on um, a project remotely with colleagues in Chile, but I uh, being able to do this gives you the opportunity to get to know both sides. But to go back to headquarters in Garching, this is the office building where uh, the, the fellows in Garching work. If you're lucky, you will get an office on this side where you see the beautiful new supernova building and behind it, the view to the Alps. Um, and next, I would like to, tell, to take you inside of the, the, the office building, the old building in headquarters. And this is the entrance, the main entrance. And what you immediately see when you enter the building is the library. And the library here uh, is the spot where we spend uh, a lot of our science activities. This is the main interaction place where we meet with colleagues for informal and for more formal meetings. We, we can have a screen here. We have many of the seminars that happen daily at ESO uh, in this cozy space. Uh, another point, another place where we get to interact a lot um, is the cafeteria. Here we have our daily science coffees, which hopefully will soon resume again. Now we do them online, but we usually gather in this space. 
with the, the, the panorama windows to the outside and we exchange ideas from practical work to, to also um, to, to, to also scientific ideas and we interact a lot with um, with the colleagues that are in the other building, the colleagues that are here, everyone gathers here at least once a day. And finally, I would like to, to, to stop over in our main auditorium. This is um, the room where we have usually the biggest colloquium of the week. Uh, since Garching is situated on a campus surrounded by a few other institutes uh, of astrophysics, we have a large community and we have a weekly seminar that uh, invites speakers uh, worldwide um, for, from around the world, different astrophysicists, and we meet in this auditorium for at least one really impressive talk a week. Um, so with, with this view um, of, of the, 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 the video that is presented here on this wall, I'd like to to mention also that uh, currently in Garching we are also developing a lot of instruments that will go to the observatory sites. We're also working extensively on um, the, the, the development of the ELT. So all of the people that are working on these projects are in headquarters and the fellows get to interact with them and to even get involved in projects uh, maybe outside of the functional work or as functional work. So with this, I'd like to hand over to Linda, who will show us the, the office buildings in Santiago in Vitacura. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Rosita. So this is the, the main gate, the, the entrance to the, to the office in Santiago. If we look a little bit to the, to the left here, we see the large ESO garden that goes all around here. Behind you see the uh, Municipal de Vitacura, which is on the other side of the street. This building here is the uh, ESO office building, the Vitacura office building. It's the first building that has been uh, uh, built there. And here on the right side, we see the, whoops, the Alma building. So this is the new Alma building. And uh, we go in there now. So this is the reception area of the, of the new Alma building. You see everything is still shiny. <laughs> Uh, outside here is the garden area of Alma, an in inner garden of Alma, which is very nice. Here is the cafeteria as well. So let's have a good look at the garden. So this is where we sometimes meet with colleagues from Alma, where we can have coffee or also have lunch, take our, our food there. Um, this is the, the building itself, the Alma building from, from the back or from the inner side, basically. Let's go back here. So here you look again towards the reception area on, on the left behind these squares is the cafeteria, which is also very modern, has a very nice coffee machine. And uh, well, we meet here to, I mean, I am, I am an ESO astronomer, so I'm on the other side of the building. But here we meet with, with Alma colleagues when there is a colloquium, for example, after the colloquium to have a coffee here, or sometimes to have lunch together with our Alma colleagues. And, it's a very nice uh, area. Probably Hugo could say more. Whoops. Okay, I have to get used to putting this. Okay, let's get back to the reception area. <laughs> if you go down, down this stairs, you get to the um, Alma Auditorium which is uh, the largest one that we have on the Vitacura campus. So there's the inner um, auditorium is usually set up like this. But then behind you have, uh, you have several desks as well and you can fit additional chairs. You can put something like 120 people there. And uh, we have broadcast to all, the, to all the sites. We have the video equipment. We also have conferences together with Garching there. So from the Alma Auditoria, I will go out to the main park where we have started now from the other side. So this is again the gate, but from the other side, here on the left side, you see the Alma building. Then in the back, there is an administrative building, the satellite building, which is for administration basically. So I will not go in there now. And this is the old ESO uh, Vitakura office. 
So to go in there, we see the, the foyer, the, the entrance area. Here's the reception where people are coming in. Here towards the left is a is uh, the staircase and they are all the science officers so all the fellows the students staff astronomers most of them are working on this side there are a few more offices over there on the right side but uh, it's mainly for um i mean it's mainly for human resources and some administrative people as well and the directors are sitting there so this is the the entrance here we go to the garden to the iso garden and you already see the chairs in the back so this is the the terrace as well and here is the cafeteria which i cannot enter for some reason so you, you will have to come to iso and come as fellows to be able to to see the cafeteria but here on the left you see the um, the some of our of our conference room so we have several small conference rooms scattered all over the building and we have this large uh, conference room here which is uh, the uranus one um, we also have this curtain in the back that we can remove so then we can con connect it to the to the one behind and then we can fit something like 100 people in total there and again this is like with broadcasting with with video connection and everything so p things can be the, the talks can be um can be streamed they can be uh, recorded they they can be dist uh, distributed to other sites so that people who are working in Paranal, who are working on La Silla at the moment, who are at Alma at the moment, at the OSF, can connect as well and, and listen to the talks. Okay, let's come back to the entrance hall to look in this direction. So we have this inner court, the atrium here, where we also sometimes can sit outside, have coffee. There are some tables here, as you can see. And if we go down here in this direction, we come to the library, which I think I have to click here to get there, yes. So this is the other side of the of the atrium, inside the library already, and this is our sitting area there. So there are shelves with the news journals and books that have been, uh, have been bought. And here in the sitting area, we usually gather every morning at 11 o'clock to have our science coffee. Of course, now in COVID times, we also do this online, but normally we, we meet there. Here's the cubicle of the librarian. And then behind is the actual library, which you see again from the other side. So the cubicle with our librarian. Then next to it on the, on the, on the windows, close to the windows, there are some working spaces as well for visiting visitors, short-term visitors who won't get an office, but if we have too many people, they have to work from there. Um, then there's the, the library itself in two floors with journals. All the journals are now online, so most of them are not displayed anymore. And we leave the space for, for the books, which are well, all over there. OK, and I think with this, I will go, uh, I will head back. And if I am not completely mistaken, I think we have already, we can already start our question and answer session. So you are welcome to ask questions. And uh, the way we anticipated this is that I will read the questions and hand them to Rosita, to Giacomo, or to Johanna, who are going to uh, to uh, give the answers. Hugo had to leave. He had another meeting now. So uh, um, if there are any more Alma questions, we can try to answer them. Otherwise, we will have to uh, ask him via email later and, and, and get back to you at a later stage. Okay, let me start with uh, reading the questions. I think the first question is for you, Johanna. Um, I am interested to apply both for Chile and Germany, but I have no observation experience. How difficult would it be to work in Chile if I need to learn everything from the beginning? Um, I think that's a great question. I um, So I, I cannot really put myself into your shoes because uh, I came to Chile with quite a bit observing experience already um, behind my behind me because I went observing many times during the PhD. Um, but I think in the end, because ESO is such a unique place, it's anyways not quite like the other observatories. And um, it's definitely a steep learning curve when you arrive because likely everything is going to be very, very new. And 
I think you have to be familiar with the general observing techniques. So if you can tell a spectrograph and the camera uh, apart, that would, of course, be um, beneficial already for the start. Um, but then I think we, we all arrive there, I think, kind of with, with a fresh plate. But you have to be, yeah, you have to be kind of quick thinking and you have to be able to work long hours while you're tired and uh, be really, really motivated to learn everything in, in, a, in a very short time. And I think this is what matters most, as Linda already alluded to in the interview, it's a lot on the soft skills, how you deal with stress, maybe how you, how you communicate with uh, visiting astronomers, things like this. But um, I think to come there without any observation experience um, would be a challenge, but I think if you were really into it, it might be doable. Maybe then, you want to add something, Linda? No, I think I think you're right. I, I totally agree. Yes, I think if you are enth enthusiastic about it, if you're motivated, uh, you will have to learn how to observe, but that's definitely doable, yes. Um, a general question is here about the application deadline. I just to say this again, it's on the 15th of October and it's every year, yes. Um, the next question would be, I think, let me see, I have a lot of questions here, but a lot of comments as well. Um, is there a possibility and is it common for ESO fellows in Garching to collaborate with staff at the adjacent uh, Max Planck Institute as well? I don't know, Rosita, you want to answer that one? Yes, um, it, it is very common. So the, the buildings are really close by physically, the interactions between the institutes exist. And also, since you will be leading your own independent research program, you're free to interact with uh, whatever collaborators you can find. So this is happening right now and is very welcome that, that uh, the ESO staff and, and fellows interact with the surrounding institutes. Thank you. Giacomo, there's a question for you. Is there a maximum age or number of years after PhD when you can apply? No, there is, so the simple question is there is no upper limit. So it's very simple. Yeah. So the only, the only limitation is to need to have the PhD in the years while you're, in which you apply, but not no upper limit. How common is it to combine functional work as a fellow in Garch as a fellow? Uh, sorry. How common is it to combine functional work as a fellow in Garching? Uh, if I really want to develop technical skills plus do outreach, is this feasible, Rosita? So, in in principle, it can be flexible. I can speak from experience with uh, functional work in in so being in Garching and having functional work in Paranal. The training is very demanding and it's not really worth it if you're not going to spend all of the 25% of the time uh, on it. However, you can get technical skills working in the other departments. And if you make a strong case that this is indeed really good for you and for your career, you can uh, divide the functional work between different departments. It is happening right now uh, for, for some people, but it really depends on the case and it depends on what functional work you'll get. Is it commissioning of an instrument? Uh, which is a shorter term project and then you spend some time on it, some time on outreach, or is it um, something more permanent? And, and it is important that the first uh, months after you arrive or weeks after you arrive as a fellow, you really negotiate and explore what options are available because the flexibility is there. Yes, I think so. Okay, can I just, yeah. uh, sorry, I think what, uh, sorry, Linda, to, to just, I wanted to make a general comment, which is I think what Rosita said is, I, I, is exactly, I completely agree with that and also with what Joanna said, but I wanted to mention something that maybe bridge a bit of the two answers. So there is every function of what any time you spend, we, we comes with the trainings part. So there is a, we do have, uh, training program specifically for each of the of the of the, of, of the job that you're going to do. So you are Paranal, there is a training program for, for to allow you to get into, through a, what we call a certification process that allows you to gain gain more and more responsibility into uh, operating instrument and telescopes. So, and in Chile, in, in Garching, is, is, we do not have that formal say uh, certification, but still 
there is a training part that needs to be taken into account. So you need to let, because you are investing time, but you're also getting something in the tool, which I think is very important. You're getting a know-how, you're getting, you're learning, uh, you're learning really uh, expertise. Uh, and so you need to think, when you, when you think, when you will be, when you will come here, you will be, basically, we will welcome you and we will ask you, we will encourage you to go through the different proposal that we have and talk to the line manager so that you can make your, up your mind what you want to do. But and please consider all the time that there is this you know, training part. And so it is very important to give you continuity, in a sense, to, to what you do, because you will be able to, to basically make the most out of the training that you get. So at some point, you will become more and more, and more independent. So maybe you get more and more uh, responsibilities. And this bring you even more uh, experience. So it's, it's really. It's really important to make the most after these three years uh, that you, you have a, a clear understanding of, of the entire project. But we help you with, as an office, we help you through all the entire process to, to follow the steps in, in case of any uh, doubts and questions. Sorry, okay. I just wanted to add this. That's fine. Next question is for Johanna. Um, how can you solve technical problems? Is there or are there any technical workers that would help you? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I think we have to be very clear that we as astronomers, we are actually uh, in the minority when it comes to the stuffing of Paranal. So there is a large group of very skilled engineers who actually um, solve most of the technical problems for us, to be fair. Um, but sometimes during the night, what happens, there are some quick fixes that we can do ourselves without breaking stuff, which are mostly on the software side. But then a big part of the job is more, how do we report and analyze the problem in the first moment when it hits us, so something stops working? How do we report it in a good way that the engineers the next day can, can actually fix it? I think the next question would be for Giacomo. So first, thank you for the nice presentation. And uh, Sanda wants to know, is there any funding available for research fellows to invite visitors, collaborators, or organize meetings? And how does that absolutely. work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So we do have uh, programs for each of these topics. In fact, we have a visitor program. We have a, a workshop program, as I was mentioning. So um, it, this is all, of course, for, uh, for you, actually, to use it. Uh, so uh, and this is basically so. For example, for the for the workshop, we, we I think is a one of the of the very important aspect of so the, the the workshop. So we have a call every every year. Uh, so you apply, you 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 team with someone at ISO and someone outside ISO also. So you create a, 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 a SOC, right? Uh, and, uh, and then you get the full support about the logistic from our uh, from our basically from inside. And, and then you, well, if you get that, then you can, you're, you're able to organize a workshop, a science workshop on, on a specific topic. And I think this is an aspect that really is a major uh, point because through that you don't only go, you, you basically, you not only invest time in what you like, which is science and which is a specific topic, but also you get to, to, to basically meet and interact with the community outside. So this is all uh, absolutely fantastic, I think. And we host, in fact, uh, several uh, workshops inside our premises, uh, which both in Garchin and in Santiago as well. Uh, and this also can be used also to team with the people in, in Santiago as well. And the same for the visitor program. So we have a visitor program. Visitor can come. You can invite them. Uh, you can ask them to apply if they come for a long time, even for two, three, four months. Um, of course, there is a selection process involved, but this is all feasible and you will be absolutely welcome to to to, to do this I mean, we are looking forward to that actually. okay the next are some greetings to rosita and johanna from uh, la palma from fellow in la palma just mentioning this um then there is a question about public media relations fellowships so i'm not quite sure if this is um well i will just post this to Rosita because I think this is more related in Garching but maybe Francisco can say something as well if they have something in the outreach department so the question is are there any public media relations fellowships available well uh, we have a program for uh, internships to work in the department in the um, communication department actually we have two uh, vacancies open there are not fellowships but I would like to show you 
how to how to go to the um, um, to the site and uh, search for the, for the jobs that we have at ISO. So it's very simple. You go to ISO.org, and in the main website, you just press jobs. This this uh, will be explained by Giacomo in in, in deep in some moments, but uh, related to the um, communication part, we have a media officer and we have a head of creative team uh, opening. Uh, so if you would like to work with us. Okay. And that's it. And maybe Rosita can say something about uh, ESO fellows working with uh, media relations. This is possible. Yes, uh, you can spend your functional work supporting the supporting the Department of Communications. Uh, probably Giacomo knows what will be available maybe in the next months. Uh, it depends year to year what what teams need support. Uh, but I am sure that if if you have an interest, that yeah, could be this, possible. this is one of the of the different departments where we you can spend in fact your functional work as Rosita said. So. Uh, upon your arrival, then we, we can look into this together. You can talk with the uh, with the line managers in that division, and then you can uh, decide, in fact, to help our press release, our public relation outreach. All of that uh, is absolutely part of our one of our core mission, actually, to deliver and communicate with our community. So this is absolutely yes. There's a question again about age and uh, what are the uh, the necessities to get a P uh, to get the ESO fellowship. Uh, so again, there's no age limit, but you do need a PhD. So even with 39 years old or, or older, you can apply if you recently done your, your PhD and, and you can apply for a fellowship, uh, but you need a PhD. So um, that is uh, a mandatory. Um, there is Wait, as these fellowships are to support independent research, does this mean that you do not have a supervisor at all and no senior astronomer who can give feedback on your research work? I don't know who wants to take that question. I can uh, maybe give some thoughts about it. Uh, yes, we, are, we do not have, uh, have a science, scientific supervisor in this way, which means that gives us a lot of freedom. But that doesn't mean that we don't have people who give us feedback. We can actually choose a mentor from the faculty. And I think in general, the, the senior astronomers at ESO are very open always to sit down and to discuss and to enter new collaborations. So just because you on paper don't have, um, have this uh, scientific supervisor, that doesn't mean that um, you will be left alone with your science. There are also yearly meetings with the heads of the Office for Science to discuss the progress. And I think that really helps us as fellows to, to stay also, especially in Chile, where we have uh, quite a large load of duties to also scientifically stay on track. Yeah. Um, Giacomo, a quick follow up by for the question about the ISO supernova. Question is, do you need to speak German to work at the ISO supernova? Uh, no, no. Um, of course, I mean, German speak because there are many visitors from from German schools, for example, uh, or, and, and this is, of course, a plus. But this is not uh, uh, absolutely no, no, no. You can, uh, I mean, you need to speak English, of course, but if even in your mother tongue, it's also welcome because there are always visitors. First of all, you assist. The activities inside, so you help with the with the with the practical with the exposition. You help you help with the with the auditorium. So there is a lot of practical work to be done. To, because the, as a matter of fact, the, the supernova is doing operations, if you want, which is related to operating a, a museum through all the exposition. So this is a very again another interesting experience that you can gain. But concerning then talking to schools, talking to visitors, then you can do it in English when it's. Uh, or you can do it in your mother tongue language also, when there is a specific uh, school, for example, coming from your country or something like that. The next question would be for either Rosita or Johanna. Uh, do I understand it correctly that if you want to do more of observing, it's more practical to apply for the Chile Fellowship rather than the Garching one? I don't if, know who to start, but... If it's, if it's pretty, 
Phrase this practical? I'd say yes, because if you want to have the, the observing experience from Garching, it will involve a lot of trips to Chile. So if, if, if it's called practical, then yes. But on the other hand, it is possible to have the good sides of, of both worlds, which is, which is what I'm doing. So it is uh, slightly more logistically complicated and it has limitations, but it is possible to get observing experience both with Alma and uh, in Paranal as a Garkin Fellow. But if you want to get a lot more experience, then the, the fellowship in Chile is the right one. Yeah, I don't know, Joanna, you want to add, add something? Yes, or? I think um, because we spend uh, twice as much time there, um, that means that uh, after we've completed basically the initial training, um, we have a bit more time actually to explore really and to get a bit more involved uh, in projects directly at, at the observatory, um, which I think also counts as uh, observing experience because yeah, we, we will be out of, of out of the initial training um, er, earlier basically because we spend more time at the mountain and if, if you want a lot of hands-on experience, uh, this is something you might want to consider. Absolutely. Okay, the next question, I'm not sure if this refers to Chile or Garching or maybe both. So everybody can answer who won. <laughs> Hi all, my question regards the application material. I have scientific background in data analysis. I can use reduced data like surveys and not much in data reduction. Would that be a problem? Um, I, I can take this if no one else jumps in, but uh, it is not a problem because if you have understanding of data, uh, you, you can learn how to do the reduction. As Giacomo said, there is training time for each of the functional work tasks and you, you will have uh, the, the time to learn these skills. So in my opinion, this is not a major problem, um, but you, you, you need to have the understanding of, of working with the data, which includes some understanding of how reduction is done, even if, it's, if you haven't done it practically yourself. Yeah, I think there is there is a lot of training on the job on the Paranal side um, because in the end each of the instrument actually has a different data reduction pipeline, so nobody is expected to arrive on Paranal knowing all all these dozens of pipelines. Uh, so um, this is actually some part of the training. But as Rosita said, I think um, a prerequisite is that you understand the steps already which are involved in the in the reduction from the raw data to the finished product. Uh, maybe I can add something, Linda, very quickly. Sure, go ahead. Since the, the question mentioned the application material, and so I, I thought to, I would like to emphasize, so it's important to not, to not forget that the main, the main, um, the main point that is you need to, what we really appreciate in our fellows is the, the scientific independence. So you, when you apply, you, you have to think and to, to basically put together a research plan and, and that basically allows you to, make, to be a scientist, to grow it as an astronomer and that you want to grow to bring basically through the, the years of the fellowship until the end of your fellowship. So what I, what I mean, all the technical part, it is of course relevant. And as, as, as uh, Rosita and Oana as, as witnesses very beautifully, eh, it's something that you will gain, you will learn, you can explore. But, but the main, you know, uh, I would say the core <laughs> task, the core activity is science. And you are a scientist and you should enjoy your science. You should, um, so don't, don't, uh, all the other details, of course, they, they are not details, they are important that you need to, 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 I mean, to realize that you are going to an observatory and make the most of the, out of it. And, and we should, and those are ways to explore those facilities, but, but f think about your, your scientific profile, basically, and how this is going to be, bring you to the next step of your career while you pass through the ESO. Uh, ESO. And we at ESO also hope, we know we have an infrastructure through the Office of Science through which we use, we help you to promote you as a, as a scientist. Um, so that just I wanted to mention that science is, is, is very important. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see any more questions right now. I don't know if I missed something. I'm just going through the list again, but I don't think so. 
So if there are no more questions, then I would hand over to Giacomo to give a short summary and to put the, the most important things to mention everything about the fellowship again. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what is like. very good. Thank you uh, for, for so this is the basically the web page of the fellowship program that you I, I encourage everyone to go who is interested in the program. So it's here and the science and then you go to fellowship program and to science activity fellowship program. So here basically what what you here you can explore the pages to learn more and about the fellowship. Uh, first, very important point, the deadline is the 15th of October, the call is already out. The first thing you need to do, as it was mentioned in one of the questions, is basically you go to instruction for applicants and there here you have to download a form, an application form, and this form is used basically to, to, to build your application. And this has to be go, to go together with the cover letter, with the motivation letter, the application, and then the contact details of three person, of three uh, they are gonna basically uh, write the recommendation letter. Please remember to do to start the application through our recruitment portal as soon as possible because then you can trigger an email, a notification to the three person that you would like them to write the letter for you in a, well in advance. So don't wait last minute. You can start the application online and then you can leave it there and then work on your application form and then upload it later, even the, at the last minute, as I have the astronomer usually do. <laughs> but maybe do it a bit in advance. But So you can have a look at the recruitment process just to understand the details of how the recruitment is done and the, and the, and the application and the, basically the, the selection criteria, which I think is very important. You can see in our pages also the, uh, some details about the projects, about the program, how we support you, uh, the fellow research. You also have a frequently asked uh, question page where you see all some answers to some of the most common questions that you have. And uh, so two things I wanted to highlight to the end is that you have link to our uh, science staff. Basically, if you click in one of these, you go to this page where you can see all the science staff in, in Garkin and, and with, you can fit it by position so you can see all our fellows and our, uh, and our students and faculty people and the same for Chile. Uh, you, uh, you can see also the same in Chile. You can have all the category, fellow, students and, and so on. And the other thing which is very important is the contact page. So you can see here the contact in particular there is a uh, um, Antoine Marin, which is the chair of the Fellowship Selection Committee in Garkin, and Linda, who is also the chair of the Fellow Selection Committee in Chile. So if you have questions, you can already any, at any time write to them and then they, they can provide you with uh, answers. Um, and uh, yes, I think this is the, the so please use the web page and go and look into the details. And remember again, 15th of October, this is the deadline for uh, for to apply for our uh, and also yeah something that I forgot there is a, there is a fellowship brochure that you can download and here you have some in some detail a description basically of our program and you can go and read some some of the things that we were that were covered during this tour can be sure where they found also in this brochure which is uh, very nice and with this I think Linda we can I guess close Yes. Well, there's one, once more, there is a question about the minimum qualification. So let's just say again that um, this is a postdoc position, the fellowship. So the minimum qualification is a PhD in astronomy, physics, or anything similar. So that qualifies you to work as an astronomer. Yeah. So uh, with this, then I would say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed the tour. I would like to thank all of you for your interest in the ESO fellowship. And I especially want to uh, say thank you to our fellows who uh, gave the tour. I would also like to say thank you to the people from the outreach department who organized it and in particular to Francisco who I forgot to introduce and I'm very sorry about this. He's the black voice in the background who every now appeared and who has been there juggling with the techniques. So we leave you with a link to the ESO fellowship pages where you can find further information. If you have any questions, any more questions, any doubts, feel free to browse there to contact us. The details are also described in the pages so you can email us or call us and um, there are several options. Um, I think that's it. Then I would close this session.
thank you very much again and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Joanna and Rosita. Bye-bye.